Bibles, if you still carry one. <laughs> we used to have to carry them. And now we put the scriptures overhead, so it makes it a little bit easier. But I encourage you, if you have a phone, and most of us do, go ahead and download version if you don't have that app. If you do have it, all you got to do is go to live, and then you'll see what Traverse City. There'll be a bunch of different churches that use it. But you can go ahead and click on our notes. Click on their notes, too. It'll just be a blessing. But you can download them if you want to during the service and then look at it through the week. I would encourage you to do that or take notes as you follow. Let's read this together, 1 Chronicles 29.3. It says, Moreover, I have set my affection on the house of my God. I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house, my own special treasure of gold and silver. I've been talking over the past several weeks, and for those who have not been here, let me just make a statement. For those of you that have been here, well, you can just rejoice again, because we want to make sure everybody understands we are finally buying this building. So we are excited about that. Some of you have been on the journey with us for a while, others just a few years, but we're thankful that we finally come to an agreement with Faith Reformed Church, who owns the building, and and we've, we've been at two, uh, two sides of, of how much the building is worth, what we could afford, and they've always been gracious to us, always had our best interests in mind, but finally we're at a place where we can agree and we'll be purchasing this building for $475,000. So we're excited about that. It is a bargain, and we believe that God is going to bless it. We're working on financing for 80% of that. We're going to have an offering next Sunday. Say next Sunday. It's October the 3rd. Say October 3rd. October 3rd. We're going to celebrate that day, and we're going to bring an offering. I'll tell you more about what we're asking every one of us to do uh, over the last few weeks and then this week to come. Uh, we'll give you some instruction and stuff. But, man, we're believing for enough for a down payment or enough to just pay cash. I mean, no, cash is better, all right? And cash is king, as somebody said that, so it's so true. Uh, but even if we do have to borrow a portion, it's not going to strap the congregation It'll be a, a monthly payment, roughly the same as our rent has been. And so we'll pay it off quickly. If not all at once, we'll pay it off quickly, and you can be a part of that. So the scripture we read here in 1 Chronicles 29, of course, King David is making preparations for his son David to build the temple. And David makes this just really generous statement from the heart that he had after God. The Bible said that he was a man after God's own heart. How would you like to be a man or a woman after God's heart? You know, you and I, if we, if, we, if we look at the examples in the Bible, Jesus being the foremost and utmost, right? But so many others, and David here in the Old Testament had such a heart for God. He said, Lord, I'm not going to only provide all that I have provided, which was a lot. He says, I'm going up and above. Somebody say up and above. And I believe there's times in life where God just calls us to go up and above, to live that life. In fact, Jesus said this. He said that if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow. He says if you love your life more than me, you can't be my disciple. And our life is the things that our life consists of. All right? Time, talent, treasures. How we spend our life here on this earth is so important. I want to be a man like David. Or if you're a woman, you want to be a woman like David and have the heart of generosity. Amen. Jesus was generous. The Bible said that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth and that he went about doing good and healing all who oppressed the devil. Of course, we know Jesus worked miracles and healed people, but it said he went around doing good. Jesus was a philanthropist. There's a word, and I got it out too. All right. He did good. He gave to the poor. And we do that as a ministry, and we help abroad in all kinds of things. We've talked about that over the last few weeks. And God has allowed us to be able to spread the gospel, because how many know the best good we can do is make sure people hear the good news of Jesus Christ? But as David sets the bar here in the example in his statement, we can read in verse 6. Read with me. It says, Then the leaders of the fathers' houses, leaders of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands and of hundreds and the officers over the king's work offered willingly. They followed suit and they offered willingly. And let me just say right here, God is asking us to offer willingly. I'm not here trying to twist your arm, but I am making you aware of one of the greatest investments you and I can come across. In fact, it is the greatest investment is investing in the kingdom of heaven. 
But God wants us to give willingly, not grudgingly. We'll look at some scriptures, not compulsive giving, but just doing it because we love God, because we want to be generous, and because we have a heart to see people come into the kingdom of heaven. And that's really what God is asking us to do, to be a part not only in our generation, but in this building. By paying for this building, it will allow us to build on. I'll show you some slides towards the end that will show you how we can grow over the next decades, really, if you will, in this place, even if Jesus tarries and I go on to be with him, the next generation of leaders, the next generation of, of participants can use this facility as we grow. And again, I'll show you more towards the end of this morning's message. But the truth is, Jesus made this statement. I love it, Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And in being generous and generous-minded, what we're doing is directing our heart. When we give into the kingdom of heaven, we are focused on kingdom things. Why? Because we need money. We do. I'm not going to ask you to lift hands because most of us will sit there and say, I don't need no money because they think money's bad. Money is not evil. All right? Money's not evil. Somebody say, mo money. Mo money. Come on now. There's nothing. You know, money is just a reflection of who you are, what you do with it. I, I know I've used this example before, but it's one of the best. You know, if I, if I happen to be walking down the street and there's a drug deal going on and the cops go by and they drop all the stuff, including the money, well, I don't want the stuff, so I'll kick that to the side. But how many know? Mo money. I'm taking the money. <laughs> so whose money is that right there? Yours. It's my money. <laughs> they ran. That makes it mine. Possession is what? Nine-tenths of the law, they say, or something like that. So I'm going to take that. I'll put that in my pocket. That money will not make me go to the crack house. <laughs> I'd be putting it in the offering. Come on. Somebody gave me money this week. I said, I'm going to let you know. It's going in the offering on top of what Trish and I are already giving. It's going towards the purchase of the building. They said, okay. See, money will only do what... You direct it to do, and when you direct your money properly, your heart will be focused in the kingdom of heaven. And that's why God calls us to give tithes and offerings. Yes, 10%. I said it, 10% and above. People say, well, t you know, tithe is Old Testament principle. I've talked about all that, so I won't spend a bunch of time on it. But, yeah, it's an Old Testament requirement in keeping the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. But if grace empowers us to live a life like Jesus, how many know it doesn't make sense that we give less with more inside? And so God's calling us to go up and beyond. And you see all through the scriptures in the New Testament, the church, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, what they do is they combine their monies. Some sell properties. Some of you having garage sales. I know some of you sold some items. Maybe God's asking you to do that. Maybe you're in the process of doing that because we've been talking about this for a few weeks. But they had all things in common. They helped to spread the gospel. How? With their money. That's one way. Now, our witness is a big part, how we spend our week. But our money is like putting our money where our mouth is. If we say we want to be a part of revival, how many know it can start with money can start your revival, what you do with it. All right, it really can. This morning I want to talk about the fact that God rewards good stewardship or management. We don't use the word stewardship much anymore. It's an old English word. We'll just say management. But God rewards us when we steward what he gives us well. Hebrews eleven six 6, it says, But without faith is it impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So first got to believe that God is, but then we need to believe that he'll reward us. Yes. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that reward is our primary reason for giving. Okay, that, that just, that's, that's kind of on the border of greed. I'm going to give so I get more. That's not it. There's nothing wrong with having more, but we give out of a generous heart that loves God and loves people. But then we need to look to our reward. I'll tell you why. Because you need the money that's in your hand. You need the money that's in your wallet. If you don't need it, take it out and give it to the person sitting next to you. Come on. But we need it. And so when we make that decision, we need to believe that God's going to reward us. Because the biggest reason we don't give, especially the way God asks us to give, is fear of running out of money. Just be honest about it. Well, I have enough. Well, I have enough to retire. And listen, it's good to save and prepare for the future. I'm not saying that. But the best investment for our future is giving into the kingdom of heaven. 
giving into the kingdom of heaven. And when we pool our resources and do something like buy a building, people, people get religious and say, well, pastor, the church isn't a building. No, but in January, how many know? A building is nice. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people get so religious with stuff. Well, the church is not a building. Yeah, and I can tell by the way you talk, you don't give a dime to the church. Come on. And we say these things. I mean, you know, who owns, who owns this building when we pay for it? The church does. And it's part of the kingdom of heaven. Everyone who invested. I don't own it. Pastor Tony doesn't own it. I'm just part of who we are. And you and I get to be a part of God's savings plan. Come on, somebody. Not only do we get to save for the future, people get saved in the process. 1 Corinthians 3, 8, it says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward. Receive his own reward. Again, the church is not a building, and going to church doesn't make you any more a Christian than being born in a garage makes you a car, <laughs> all right? It says we each get our own reward. Just going to church doesn't mean you get a reward. I'm just, I know I'm, I'm bursting some religious balloons this morning. Just going to a church does not get you a reward. Now, going to a church, making Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior is the greatest reward you can ever have. But when we're just going, we're not participating. There's no reward in that. We may enjoy it, may have some good friends, but how many know if we get involved, time, treasure, and talents, get involved in the ministry, giving to the work of the ministry where it's this church or another church, maybe you're visiting or you're watching online or whatever, being involved in the work of God where God has called you to be. It's part of God's plan. We see it all through Scripture. And the Bible's clear. We are not saved by our good works, but I believe we're saved for good works. Read this with me, Ephesians 2. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Do you see that? which God prepared before and that we should walk in them. God has a perfect plan for your life and my life in the area of being stewards, good stewards, managers over the money he gives us is a big part of that. And the truth is every one of us, I believe, needs to distinguish between belief and behavior. Belief and behavior. What we believe will determine where we spend eternity. All right? Our behavior det determines how we spend it. What we do once we're in the kingdom with our time, our treasure, our talents determines how we're going to spend eternity. Why? Because God is a rewarder. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place. Jesus talked about reward time and again. We'll give some examples today, but even more moving into next week, we'll talk about it a little bit more. Jesus rewards us not only for eternity, but also in this life. Look at this, Mark 10. So Jesus answered and said, Surely I say to you, there's no one who has left house or mothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands. Somebody say stuff. stuff. For my sake in the gospels, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers, children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. There's always persecution. It's called tests. Say tests. tests. I'm going to do a message. Uh, we'll finish this up next week. Take the offering. J.D.'s got the pulpit the week after that. I'm going to start a series that I titled Foundations. And part of that will be that, you know, there are tests we go through. But God has a way for us to live that we can always get an A on the test. If we do it the way he says. All right. But here it says that when we leave things. Now, he's not suggesting that we leave our families, even though God will ask us to move sometimes to leave our comfort zone, if you will. He wants us to take care of our families, our spouses, our, our children. That's not what he's saying. But if those things limit us and keep us back from doing what God has called us to do, Jesus says that's not good. He says if you lay those things down for the kingdom, I will reward you not only in the age to come, but here, right now. Say this with me. Say right here. Right here. Say right now. right now. And God promises that. He wants us to live blessed lives. Again, it's not only about reward. That's not our primary purpose. 
Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the end of the age, and he says, Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is the servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his stuff. Somebody say stuff. That's what he's saying. How am I managing the stuff that God has given me? And here he says, when he returns at the end of the age, if we're good stewards or managers, he's going to reward us. If we're not, in fact, there's a parable where Jesus, I think I mentioned it last week, if you were here, if not, you can get online, where, where Jesus tells a parable of a, a wealthy man who distributes finances to three managers, and then he goes away for a while. Two of them invest it wisely, and they, they double their money. He commends them. The one who just kept what he had and said, here, I, I'm giving you back what yours because I know that, that you're shrewd and, and that you come and, and collect. He says, so here, I'll give it back. And the Bible says he took it from the one who had one and gave it to the one who had more. Mm -mm -mm. So we need to release. We need to give. It's part of God's plan for our lives as faithful and wise servants. Again, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Luke 16, 11, we talked about this last week. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, or to your trust rather, true riches? Mammon is the spirit of this age and the way money, finance, the way the whole system works. And we talked last week, if you were here, you can get online and listen to it. If you were here, get online and listen to it again, because we forget most of what we hear, all right? We need to listen to it over and over again sometimes. But the only way the Bible teaches us, the only way that we can get free of the spirit of mammon is to give, to tithe and give offerings, up and above 10%. I really believe that. And boy, if the church would get a hold of this, the church worldwide would get a hold of it. The statistics that, that talk about the church worldwide, it's, it's really, it's sad. But, but well under 3% of the worldwide church gives any money at all to the gospel. Less than 3% worldwide. Some churches are, are better than that. Churches who aren't afraid to talk about it, like us, do better. But even then, it's, it's only, you know, 20 or 30% of the people that go to the church. I mean, they say you're doing good. If you can get 50%, they're like, Whoa! You're having revival there in Traverse City. I mean, it's true. We just, we just we hold back because of fear. But the Bible says that the way we break the fear and the hold that mammon has on us is by giving. Again, I talked about it last week, so please get online and, and check it out. It'll be a blessing to you. Because God wants to bless us with more. So Somebody say, mo money. money. All right. In Genesis chapter 12, God is speaking to Abraham. He says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Of course, this is the covenant that God is making with Abraham that includes you and I, promising that he would send his son Jesus as a covenant that would secure his words here. And the Bible says we've been grafted in through this same covenant. We have been brought into the kingdom of heaven through the covenant that God made with Abraham. But God's heart, not only for Abraham, but every one of us, is to bless us, to be a blessing. God doesn't want to bless us just for us. He wants us to share the wealth, to spread it around, to spread the gospel, to get involved in a church with our gifts, our time, our talent, our treasure. And the good news is 2 Corinthians 9, 8 says this, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency, always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance forever. Don't you love that? All sufficiency in all things, always to have an abundance. This is, this is God's provision plan, and it's way beyond provision. Yes, he meets our need, and he doesn't want us to be greedy, but he wants to give us as much as we'll manage responsibly. And that's the truth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'll give you a little bit of what's going on. This is kind of my paraphrase. But Paul the Apostle is writing a letter to the Corinthian church. They have said that they want to give an offering to help the church in Jerusalem. Paul is sending two of his servants to go and to collect that offering and he's kind of reminding them, saying, hey, guys, I've been traveling, and I've been boasting and bragging about your generosity. 
And he says, and because I've been boasting about your generosity, I'm encouraging you to do what you said you would do. So I'm doing the same thing today, encouraging us. You know, many of us have already prayed. Maybe you'll take this week and, and pray some more. I, I hope you will. But the thing is, are we going to do what God asks us to do? And that's different for each and every one of us. We all have different treasures, a different amounts. We're all able to give different amounts. But it's according to the sacrifice. What did it cost? What did it cost me? You remember a couple weeks ago I talked about Jesus watching those who gave into the treasury in the temple. Jesus watches our giving. They said that the woman who came with two mites gave more than all of the rich people because they gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her livelihood. So it's not the amount. We all can get different amounts, but am I laying something down that costs me something? That's what David said. I will give nothing to the Lord, something that costs me nothing. So God is asking us to give. And so Paul is saying, hey, I've been bragging about your generosity, but now follow through because it's, it's one thing to write something down, but it's another thing to follow through on it, isn't it? And so I want to encourage all of us, as Paul did, do what God is calling you to do and follow through willingly. And then he says this. He teaches in chapter 9, verse 6. But this I say, he who sows sparingly, will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Don't give it grudging. Give it cheerfully, joyfully. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always have all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Listen, don't give it with a bad attitude. Just don't do it. Say, well, pastor, my attitude's not good. Then ask God to help you change your attitude. Because here's what most of us do. We just won't give at all. No, say, God, I'm struggling with this. I need your help. God puts an amount in your heart. I already mentioned this, and I don't say this because everyone's going to give different amount. Trish and I have already set an amount that we're going to give next week. And then we also prayed about it, and we believe the Lord asked us to increase our regular giving to this ministry by 20%. Now, maybe you can do that. Maybe you can't. Maybe you can do more. I guarantee you there's some of us today that can do more than what we think we can. God is asking us to give sacrificially, each and every one of us. I believe that. If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. Sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. We're going to talk a little more about seed in just a moment. But we are sowing seed into our future and God will increase the fruits of our righteousness monetarily. Now, there's souls involved and there's people involved, and that's, that's the richest thing of all, right? But, but also in the area of finance. Look what Jesus said in Luke 6, 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure, somebody say same measure. Amen. With the same measure that you meet or, or give, it is given back to you. In the same way, men shall give into your bosom, is what it says. So the way we give, and this, this really, Jesus is talking about more than money, but it certainly applies to money. For instance, if you give love, and he's really talking about love and other things here in this text. But love, if you, if you just run around loving people, you're going to reciprocate love. Now, I'm not saying you won't have a jerk walk into your life sometime. People, how many know there's just jerks running wild sometimes, right? So I'm not saying that. But ultimately, if you live a life where you're sowing love, you're going you're to get love in return. You're going to have a, li a life where people around you, as a matter of fact, the Bible says this, he who has friends shows himself friendly. If you want friends, get friendly. Be a friend to somebody. Reach out to somebody. So many times they say, how come nobody reaches out to me? And I understand that can be rough. But, but the antidote for that is to reach out to somebody else, to start reaching out to people. And certainly it's true with every area, including finance. And the Bible says he will reward us openly. God loves a cheerful giver. Don't give reluctantly. Don't give under compulsion. Give cheerfully. And there's a joy in giving. And listen, those of us who live this way, we know the joy of giving. We know there's fear once in a while, but we're like, no, nope, I know that there is so much more. In fact, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12 that Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, 
looking to the joy that was set before him. Jesus looked past the cross, past the sacrifice for the joy. It's the same thing with our money. Look past the sacrifice. Endure it, go past because there's joy. There's something on the other side. When we live sacrificial lives, there is a great victory and reward on the other side of our giving. And God is able to make all grace, say all grace, all grace. abound that you will have all, say all for sufficiency. All yeah, let's try that again. All for sufficiency. Say all for sufficiency. No, I made that up. So in all things, for every good work. Okay. <laughs> and I love this Philippians 419. Many of us know this scripture. It's so sweet. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And some of us love this scripture, very common, well-known scripture. And we like to quote it that, oh, God is providing my need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. If you're not a giver and a tither, you're taking it out of context and you can't apply this to your life. That's what this is talking about. Read the, read the whole text. He's talking specifically. He's saying, Philippians, he, you read it. He's saying, no one gave to me except you. He's a missionary, Paul the Apostle. And he's saying, nobody gave except you guys. You supported me. Nobody else gave me anything. But you did. And because of that, my God, the same God that provides for my needs, will provide for your needs according to his riches and glory out of his bank account. How many know God is not running out of money tomorrow? <laughs> Maybe you've heard it said, and it makes so much sense to me. If, if you pave your roads with gold... So the Bible says that the roads in, in heaven are gold. How many know he doesn't need more money? He's already got it all. And I would just say this, you know, we, 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 we put blacktop down. And I want to say this because I know this summer there's been a lot of roads closed and it's, it's frustrating at times. I really believe that uh, our Department of um, uh, Motor Vehicles and, and, and everything, they have done a heck of a job this year. The bridges they've had to replace and the road work they've had to do, we need to give it up for them. I know it's inconvenient, but, man, they got some work done. They're still finishing some work. They get the roundabouts done, and then they rip all the pavement off south of over there. Okay. But anyway, but they are doing a good job. We got to keep a good attitude. You know, it's just like uh, when, they, when they come by, the same department are the ones that plow the roads. And, you know, you get your, your driveway all cleared. I've had this happen to me. I'm like, ah, and there comes the, I just put my stuff away. And there comes the plow truck. And I have to be somewhere in a half an hour. But we need to adjust our, our attitude because how many know? I could shovel my driveway, but if they didn't clear the streets, I still wouldn't get to where I got to go. And we just have to think differently. I just, that has nothing to do with the message, sort of, because it helps us be thankful, right? And that, that's such a big part of it. But the question I want us to, to, to answer this morning is how do I view money? Do I view money as something that meets my need? Or is it something that uh, really feeds my greed? Am I, do I just want more and more and more? Even though we should look for a reward, if we're constantly wanting more and cutting corners and trying to figure out ways to swindle more into our lives at other people's benefit, that is not what I'm talking about. So is money something that meets my needs, something that feeds my greed, or something that I look at as seed? Because money is seed. It is riches and increase in seed form. Some of you plant, everybody planted tomatoes this year, I noticed, everybody. In my whole neighborhood, people that never grow tomatoes. And then everybody gives them away because they grow like weeds, right? So everybody's got tomatoes. And so when you put that seed in, how many know it doesn't look anything like a tomato plant? But you put it in and you get a reward, right? So money is a seed, and the way we handle it determines our reward in this life and the life to come. So true, so true. Not suggesting that we should live proud lives. Look at this. This will help us right here. Proverbs 30. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty or riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of the Lord. I think that is a good way to just live in a sweet spot. Lord, I'll take as much as you'll give me that I can, I can be accountable for and, and, and distribute wisely, but don't give me so much that I forget about you. Remember, it's God. In fact, the Bible says that in Deuteronomy 8. We can't turn there for time's sake, but Deuteronomy 8, God is saying, I'm bringing you into a rich land. 
He says, I'm going to bless you so much, you're going to be tempted to forget about me. <laughs> That's how much God, so much you'll forget about me. He says, but remember, this is Deuteronomy 8.18. It is me, God, who gives you the power to get wealth to fulfill his covenant. See, it all comes from him. This is a good attitude to have. Now, you got to realize that God can provide for us in ways way beyond money. Money's part of his provision, but it's only part. God can provide in ways that don't make any sense. I remember when Trisha and I were first just young Christians learning how to live this way. I, and I've shared this, this story, but it's one of my favorites. God's taught us so much. Just young Christians, and I had transferred to a job, and God used it. I had some pride in me. I had to repent because I had this jacked-up attitude about myself, and so I needed some correction, but he always does it kindly. But nonetheless, the people who hired me were they're kind of jerks, but whatever. Uh, they made promises they never kept. A few months into the job, they said, oh, no, we're going to cut your pay in half, and we're taking all your benefits away. So we had three kids under six, and all of our medical insurance is taken away, and there's no way we could live on what they told me I was going to get paid. So before the day was over, I couldn't even get on my smartphone. This is when we had dumb phones. This is years ago, okay? Like I say, our, our oldest, Tony, who's 32, was six. So this is a while ago, or six or younger. I don't remember exactly, but pretty close. So I was already, I already, before I got home, I had another part-time job that was going to be able to make, I was going to have to work, I say part-time, really going to have to work almost two full-time jobs to provide for my family. And how many know that sounds commendable, and I suppose you could say it is. And so I, I did that, and I remember the Lord spoke to me and said, well, Tony, because I knew there was no way if I was going to be working that much, I could finish Bible school, because I was enrolled in Bible school at the time. Plus, it, I didn't really have the extra to pay for it. And I remember clearly the Bible spoke to me and said, well, Tony, you can do it your way or my way. And Trisha and I prayed. She'll remember, you know, right in the midst of that, my stepfather dies. It was, you ever have one of those times in life where it's like the walls are all closing in around you? Anybody ever had that happen? I pray you never do, but chances are you will have that kind of thing in life. It just, it's like that. But don't worry about it. God's got you covered. He's got you covered. And I remember I was, I was there and, and, and I said to Trish, I said, I think God just says work that job and he's going to provide for it. She said, that's what I'm feeling. So we did. Somebody paid my full tuition to finish Bible school. And as we were living, God was teaching us, we were tithing to the local church we went to. And then we were giving offerings up and above because we, we were taught this and we've lived this way ever since. And we gave offerings and we, would, we had 10 missionaries that we gave $10 to each missionary. And I would sit, and I'd get paid. First thing i do is tithe. Next thing i do is beginning of the month. I would write $10. Many of those ministry, ministers we still have relationships with. One of them has grown huge, Rick Renner, if you know that. I mean, we're giving Rick Renner. We still support Rick Renner. $10 a month, $10 a month, $10 a month. Rick doesn't even know who I am. It doesn't matter. But God would teach us, and we did that. And I'm not kidding you, for the next almost a year, I don't know how the bills got paid. You may think I'm making this story up, but I'm telling you, as God is my witness, he took care of us. He provided for us. Even Christmas. I didn't think we'd be able to do Christmas for the kids. I'm getting ready. I am coming home for Christmas break. It is literally my last day. Christmas Eve is the next day. I told Trish, I said, I got a $200 bonus that I did not expect. They gave me 200 bucks. I went by and everything was on sale. I bought gifts for the kids, and I got Trish a new pair of shoes. You remember that? I mean, come on, how many, buy your wife a new pair of shoes. You say, well, how many shoes does a woman need? One more pair. One more pair. <laughs> and maybe you're not like that. Well, I know a lot of women are, but it's just funny. And God provided, and, and I could tell more about that story, but I don't want to just keep going on. I want to, there's a story in the Bible that's going to bless you. Look at this. It'll encourage you. Second, this is, uh, don't put it up yet. This is uh, Elijah, who is a prophet of God. The Bible tells us through this story that he prophesied that it wouldn't rain for three years. There was a great drought, and then he prayed again, and it did rain. But here's at the beginning of the drought, 1 Kings 17. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. He drank by the brook. God says, okay, prophesy that right after he prophesies a drought. He says, I want you to go live over here by the brook Cherith. He says, and, and, and ravens came and brought him a steak sandwich in the morning and a steak sandwich at night, and he drank out of the brook. 
He didn't need no money. Remember, Jesus was with Peter, and they were going to go into the temple, and they said, we need a tax. He said, Peter, go over, first fish that comes out, take the money out. There's money there for you and for me. We'll pay the temple tax. See, God provides. Say, God provides. God provides. And look at this here. He even brought him a cake. I mean, we were at a, a, some of you may know the Stanleys. Mark Stanley got married just a couple days ago, Friday. And um, Maria played keyboards, sang this morning. Also does bakes cake, beautiful cakes on the side. And she said she had some stuff left over. So this morning we're driving into church and she, she made Trish and I our own private little cake. <laughs> So where is that? It's locked up in my car. That's where it is right now. It's locked up in there. But not only did God give Elijah steak sandwiches in the morning and steak sandwiches at night, he brought him a cake. Look at this. Then he lay and he slept under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked and there by his head was a cake. You see it? Baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he laid down again. So he arose and ate and drank and he went in the strength of that 40 food, 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb to the mountain of God. So he brings him a cake and a, it's like he went to sleep. Nothing was there. He woke up. There was cake and a jar with water in it. Say God, God will, will provide. provide. But see, there's got to be a proper order. Second Corinthians 9 again. Verse 10, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. See, there's a proper order. The problem is most of us eat our seed. The Bible says he provides seed, then bread. We can't eat what he gives us. We have to sow. In fact, if we can put the NLT up there, I love the way it says it. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. Same order. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources. Doesn't get any clearer. And then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. God is teaching us how to be generous. And it comes through giving sacrificially. Giving sacrificially. I want to share a story we did not share in the first service. And, and I, I don't think we're going to have to turn there, so don't worry about that. You're just going to have to believe me that it's in the Bible. Yeah. Oh, let me find it here. You can go read it on your own. This is also in 1 Kings chapter 17. We already read a portion of that, how God provided for Elijah. In fact, maybe we should read this. If you can pull it up. Boy, I appreciate it, um, Julie. First Kings 17. I'll tell you what verse here in a moment. We'll just, I think we'll start. We're going to read it because I want you to see what, what's going on here. We'll start in verse 8. First Kings 17, 8. First Kings 17, 8. Because sometimes here's what we think. We think, well, how could God expect me to help? I don't have anything. I'm a single parent. I don't make much money. We have all these reasons that we don't think we can give. I want to prove to you it doesn't matter the amount. It's the sacrifice for each and every one of us. Verse, verse 8, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. This is after the brook had dried up. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide, commanded a widow to provide for him. A widow. A friend of mine, a preacher friend of mine years ago used to say, this is the story of the widow, widow woman. No. I thought it was funny. Okay. <laughs> hmm. So he arose and went to Zarephath. Then he came to the gate of the city. Indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread. So he, he sees her and says, please get me some water. As she's going, as a matter of fact, give me something to eat too. While you're out in the kitchen, make me a sandwich. No, I'm just having fun with you. All right. <laughs> make me a sandwich. Verse 12, and so she said, 
As the Lord God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Do you see that? Give me some water. Okay. By the way, make me a sandwich. She said, I don't have a sandwich. All I got is some bread, flour. I got these measly little sticks. I'm going to make one more meal for me and my son, and then we're going to die. We don't have anything. Do you see that? Say Bible. Bible. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. Do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it. When? First. Remember we talked about the principle of firsts. We give to God when? First. According to the word of the Lord, first. According to the word of the Lord, first. So how dare, could you imagine if CNN, constant negative news, got a hold of this? Any news. Every, news is all negative. It's like you're one side or the other, bashing the other side. Click, turn it off. Oh, my goodness. I mean, we need to be informed. I, I understand that, but it's. Imagine if they got a hold of this. Preacher tells widow woman dying to make him something to eat first, and he drives a limousine to boot. <laughs> or he has a jet or whatever, I don't, whatever it is. Drives a Buick Envision. <laughs> That's what I drive. I don't have a jet. I have a Buick. <laughs> I did say this first service, and I'll just interject it. We talked about several weeks ago about Mary pouring out her spike nerd on Jesus' feet. Her oil. Most Bible scholars agree that it's about a year's worth of wages. She poured it all out. Judas was there. We could have given to the poor. Whenever you talk about money or generosity, there's always a religious spirit there. Well, you know, we don't need to give more money to that church. Do not fear. Go do as I've said. Make a small cake first. Bring it to me, and afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. Do what you said you would do. If you haven't prayed about it, please take this week. Get involved. I am telling you, there is a blessing on the other side and provision in your life and an anointing that God wants to get into your life, and this is how it comes. We've only got a couple minutes, but I want to take this, and some of you have already seen this, but I want to make sure we all are on the same page because, boy, a week from today, I believe God is going to bless us just in a phenomenal way. This shows us over here. There. See this? This is the building we're in. Because right here we've got Josh and Justine are sitting right here. You see that? I can't hold this very straight. Look at me. You sure don't want me operating on you. Holy moly. Who's the surgeon? Tony Pasquino. Nope. Okay. <laughs> That's hard to do. I'm, how long can I hold? Okay, never mind. Here we, I was some, somewhere out there. I was, out, I was back here in the walk. Back here's a walk. You can walk back here. Okay. All right, that doesn't matter. This does. Okay. Anyway, we have about a 7,500-foot building. We can add on 12,420, roughly. This, this has already been proposed to the township, and they're, they're good with all this according to the land use. So you see this here. Uh, you could build a 400-seat sanctuary. That's about the size of the sanctuary that... They were just able to build across the street at Living Hope. I'm so proud of them. They tried to sell that building forever and weren't able to. And finally, they said, Carrie said, we're staying here. And they built a gorgeous new auditorium. But we'll pro we might go smaller than that. We'll talk about all this by the time we get there. And this is classrooms, additional parking. So you see, this is something we can add on to for years to come. Like I say, even if Jesus tarries and I go home to be with the Lord or God relieves me of my my duties or directs me in a different way this is not about me this is about what god wants to do we can sow into our future can you imagine even if god moves you in a different direction at some point and you see people getting saved and i believe god wants to do just phenomenal things through this body of believers and you hear about it and see it you're like i'm part of that i got to be part of that 
That's what God's showing us is that there's a reward on the other side. So here's what I want you to do. Two things. These cards are in front of you or behind you if you're in the front uh, row. Some of you have already done this, but grab a card. We got plenty of them. Take it home and pray. Just grab the thing. First Chronicles 29, 3, David encouraging us to give the way he did up and above what he's normally doing. Then next week's date, say next Sunday, say October 3rd. We just call it a miracle offering because that sounds good. We're going to celebrate it. We, we're we're going to have a table with a vessel that we can put it in just to celebrate. We don't pass a bucket. Um, it's, it's not going to be like that, but just something to celebrate for us to bring our treasure, whatever God has asked us to do. We are asking you to bring your best one-time gift next Sunday. Best one-time gift. You can do it online if you like, but if you want to bring it, you can do it that way. Matter of fact, you go right to our website. You can click on Heart for the House. It looks just like this. And it'll take you through a way you can do all this online if, you, if that's easier for you. But then the other card, and this is equally, if not more important, they're both equal is, is fair. They're as important. Fill this card out. We're asking you to write down what you're going to commit to give over two years to this ministry. Um, if you're already giving, just fill out the amount you're giving. We ask that you pray about increasing it because God might ask you to. But we want to be obedient, so ask him. If not, you keep it the same. Write that out for us. If you've not been a tither and a giver, become one. Pull, put that on there for us. We, we need this for the bank. The bank wants to see what we're projecting. They can look at our giving history, but they want this too. So this is really important. Please consider doing this. Fill it out. You can turn it in next week. Or again, you can do this online if you prefer. And I believe that God is going to work a miracle in our midst and not only to pay off the existing building, but to prepare to build on and add on in the years to come. All right? So do that. Pray about it. Participate in what God is doing. I know you'll be blessed for it. If you need prayer for anything, the altars are open. Our prayer team is here to pray for you. We're so glad you stopped by the website today. We pray the teaching you just listened to impacts you in a way that helps you on your spiritual journey. Please take time to check out the rest of the website. It is full of information about our church, as well as resources to help you in your walk with Christ. If you have not already attended one of our worship services, we hope you make time to visit us in the near future. Everything we do here is designed with you in mind. The Bible says your real life is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All of our activities point to one thing, our mission statement. Real people living real life with a real God who has the answers.